episode 161 featuring the first part of a brand new interview series with Mr. Graham Devine. Now Graham is probably best known for his work on the seventh guest and 11th hour but he's also worked for id as well as uh, developing several games for the Spectrum and the Nintendo Entertainment System as well as ports of uh, popular arcade games like Pole Position. This first part of the interview we focus in on his early career and everything leading up to the seventh guest. Got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Graham Devine. Hi folks, I am here with Graham Devine. He has a, been a game designer since 1978 with over 34 years of experience in the industry. He's, the, he's done so many games, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, he probably played his pole position conversion that he did for uh, several platforms, but he's probably best, better known for Seventh Guest. Uh, Quake 3 Arena and his uh, work on Halo Wars. He's been called the father of file compression and is the co-founder uh, with his family of GRL. So how are you doing today, Graham? I am doing fantastic. How are you doing, Matt? I'm doing great. So we were talking earlier about what was your first computer and uh, we came up with the Trans Am Triton. <laughs> so can you tell me a little bit about how you ended up with this computer and what, what kind of things you got up to on it? Well, my dad was working on a mainframe computer at the office, uh, ICL something or other, and um, he bought home this kit computer, a Trans Am Triton. It was already constructed, so we didn't have to solder it together. But uh, it booted up into hexadecimal, uh, a hexadecimal editor, um, basically just a, a form of a debugger. And you could enter in simple programs, and you could enter in, uh, I remember one program was a, a Lunar Lander, where it, all it came up with was question mark, and you'd type in like one or two or three, which was your burn. And then it would say four, and that's the fuel left. And then it would say, you know, you, your velocity is 10V, and you'd try to land with the actual fuel. And that was about the extenting of gaming at that time, was uh, um, you would enter one number, and two numbers would come back saying, this is uh, how fast you're going, this is how much fuel you have left. And, but every time you switched on a computer, you'd have to ed enter those hexadecimal codes in order to actually uh, play that game. So, you know, that game was about, you know, 1,000 to, you know, 1,500 hexadecimal numbers. So it wasn't a lot for, a, you know, how old I was at the time, young. But it was enough to make me want to learn how to do it on my own so that I wouldn't have to, you know, read wrote these, uh, these hexadecimal numbers every time. So I worked out how to actually program uh, um, assembly code via hexadecimal only and make my own games. So that's kind of where I first programmed was straight hex into a computer and to make it do something. Wow. I was just thinking my first ever computer game was a Jupiter Lander on the Commodore VIC-20. Oh, yeah. 23 characters a line. That was, I loved the VIC-20. <laughs> so you, after that, you got the TRS-80. Um, I mean, were you just a, come from a computer family? I mean, where were these? Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, why did you get the TR? Why did you select the TRS-80? I guess I, that's what I'm most curious about. I actually got one second hand, and um, it was it, it wasn't that you know there was you could go to Best Buy and look at the choice of computers back then. I mean, there was the TRS-80, and there was like a NASCOM one, and but there was very few choices in terms of of computers you could actually go buy. Um, so we we were not a affluent family or a rich family. In fact, we have, you know always had nothing. So we got a computer secondhand that my parents wanted me to um, to learn because I was obviously engrossed in this Trans Am Triton thing. So here's a more advanced one, and um, so the TRS-80 was it. Did you have have fond memories of the TRS-80? You remember some of the games you used to enjoy? Oh yeah, I used to play the Scott Adams adventure games. Um, because it was a cassette tape um, computer, so you could actually load games on it. I, I, I programmed games on it. I, I was trying to make um, um, a version of Battlestar Galactica because um, I tried to make uh, I, I tried my hand at filming Battlestar Galactica with a Viper model that I built, but um, unfortunately I couldn't actually build or actually really film models at that time because I, I, I suck at that. Uh, but I could. You know, program you know the virtual equivalent in on the 
what are the TRS-80 have in terms of resolution? Like 96 pixels by 48. And um, you know, to me back then, that was exactly the same as a TV set. It was like massive. It was you know, those graphics going across the side of the screen were incredible. So I made a game called Space Junk 3D. <laughs> Space Junk 3D. <laughs> Thing it did was basically when you press the space bar, an X appeared on a, over the whole screen, like you know, like that, and occasionally, and these three frames of uh, of asteroid would come at you. You know, that would be my claim to 3D was you know, small frame, bigger frame, really big frame, <laughs> and you had to shoot it in time, and um, that was kind of my first game, Space Junk 3D. Is that was that released somewhere or? Uh... Uh, you went down. Yeah, the code on the, on a website somewhere. I don't know the code. To, in, there was no printer back then, and um, you saved saved code out to a um, to a cassette tape. Um, and I, I I might have the cassette tape still. But I could probably code it in about two minutes. <laughs> okay, so when you were 16 years old, you were doing this pole position conversion. Uh, for various uh, machines. I'm just wondering, how did you get get yourself into that position where you're doing that kind of work and you're only 16? Uh, it was kind of, well, I've done a few games on the Spectrum and the, the, the ZX81. I've done a game called Firebirds and a so software monitor, hexadecimal editor thing and a bunch of other little things. That, and it was, you know, it was buying me a CD player. I, I had the, the Sony CDP-101. And all I, at one time, I had every single CD available, all two. <laughs> um, and I had in computing today, you're looking for programmers from, from Atari. And um, I was like, Atari, I got to be in on that. Um, you know, that's that's a game programming thing. And they were looking for contract programmers. So I went up to Slough and interviewed, and um, that they were doing um, conversions of pole position. So the night before, I made a demo of pole position on the Spectrum. Um, and I went up there and showed it to them. And they're like, oh my god, you did this in a night. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, we'll call you. And then like two minutes later, they called me. And um, that's how I got a job at Atari. And then you went on to Lucasfilm Games, right? Yeah. Uh, from there, doing our work on Ballblazer. Well, at Atari Soft in Slough, there was all these posters on the floor for um, the Atari Lucasfilm um, upcoming set of games, and Ballblazer was one of them. And I always remember looking at the... I still have the poster hanging on my wall, because it's a rare poster, because uh, Atari didn't actually bring out Ballblazer. And I'm like, what's going on here? What's, what's this Ballblazer thing? And um, they're like, well, we're doing this um, um, this game on the, on the um, um, Atari 800 Ballblazer, but it, it's impossible to do on the, um, on the Spectrum. Don't even think about it. And I always remember, when someone says something's impossible to me, <laughs> That means it's just going to take two hours to do. <laughs> so, uh, it took longer than two hours, but it was, it was a challenging game. But I, I wanted to make it work on the Spectrum, so and I wanted to make it work on the C64 and, and Microsoft's first game machine, the MSX, that they will never tell you actually exists. And uh, um, so I became the, the the Dave Levine did the original um, code for Ballblazer on the Atari 800, but I became the the other physics guy who was doing all the the, the, the the code to make it work on the MSX and the, the C64 and all sorts of platforms. It was fun. Yeah, from what I hear, Lucasfilm uh, was a great company to work for, especially back then. I was only out. I was out at Lucasfilm Skywalker Ranch for one visit because I was in the UK. So it was. Uh, um, I always remember showing up with the with an Amstrad CPC 464, which is another British computer, and Spectrum and um, Lucasfilm Games. What wasn't Lucas Arts at the time? First version of Lucasfilm Games was um, in the the stables at uh, Skywalker Ranch, and so I, I got to hang out there for a few weeks. And you know, yeah, that was awesome, incredible. You said the stables. Stables. That was it. So like there's a horse, or <laughs> horses around here. What? What? <laughs> the, so the place back then, I don't know if it's the same now. Was kind of a you know a country estate. So you know. The huge underground parking lot was next to the stables, and then the stables was looked like stables from the outside, but it, it was offices on the inside, and it was um, right next to like the archiving where they were archiving this movie called Star Wars, and you'd go in and look at Tie Fighters, and um, an ILM or whatever ILM was called back then made real models of the rotofoils from Ballblazer, and I always remember photographing them and, and holding them, and they're like, "That's four hundred thousand dollars," and like, 
pulled it really carefully. But it was awesome. It was incredible. Well, the first game that I noticed that you are accredited for on Moby Games is Excel, uh, which looks really cool. It's kind of this futuristic shooter thing with a lot of different gameplay modes, and uh, that came out apparently in 1985. So how did, you know, can you tell me a little bit about Excel? Excel was um, by Program Techniques. It was my, was that my first company? That was my first company, um, and that was in the UK, and um, it was, I wanted to make a game that was, uh, at that point, a rare um, was called Ultimate Play the Game in the UK, and they were bringing out games on a spectrum that looked fabulous, and they were starting to move things at per pixel instead of every eight pixels, which every game had been doing before. And uh, they were just, you know, gorgeous looking games. So I wanted to make a gorgeous looking game too, uh, and so Excel was, you know, was my attempt at a gorgeous looking game. And I was very influenced by Xevious, um, which was an arcade game at the time of. Uh, you know, just the top-down scroller, and I wanted to add some story elements to it of, uh, of um, alien race and going to find planets and so forth. And uh, um, I always try to get story into games somehow, even if it's a shooter, even if it's just, you know, blast this thing. Um, but it's, uh, it, it was a fun game to work on, but it was the uh, um, first company that was the only game it made, and the company ended, unfortunately. Well, what happened? Oh... Um, two things happened to that company. The partners that I founded it with took all the money and then threatened to, you know, to beat me up. And um, my first partner, unfortunately, got uh, into some trouble with drugs and um, became not such a great first partner. Wow. Yeah, that's a shame. Uh, wow. <laughs> I've, I've... Threatened to beat you up. Wow, that's the first. I never had anybody on with that story before. <laughs> In the '80s, man, it was it was you know it was a little different. You just don't imagine these computer programmers acting like that. But uh... I had to wait on the steps of uh, of people's houses to get my royalty checks, and uh, oh man, it, it was a different world. Well, in 1987, we have a game called Metropolis. Uh, that was uh, was that PC Junior? Is that what that is? It was PC Junior and uh, Tandy? What was the Tandy thing called at the time? Tandy One Thousand or something like that. Tandy One Thousand, um, and that game was um, um, Marconic was starting to make more quality games under the name Arcadia, and I'd made a bunch of conversions for them and done games like. Uh, Killer Tomatoes and a ho whole bunch of quick conversion games, but I wanted to make an adventure game. And so Metropolis was uh, um, an adventure game. And I, I wanted to add real speech into it so that the computer talks to you. And I was very influenced at the time by uh, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. So I wanted a newscaster to be all... If, if you read Dark Knight Returns, the newscasters give commentary on the story throughout the actual you know, the comic. So I wanted this newscaster to give... Uh, commentary on, uh, on how you were doing as you were going along and um, so it's kind of, the first Cortana was in, was in Metropolis. No, not really. I just want to read a bit from the back of the box on that. So this is a quote. Metropolis, the computer program, pushes back the frontiers of the possible. It is without doubt an unparalleled achievement in computer entertainment. Its vocabulary exceeds that of the average human being. <laughs> I mean, this sounds incredibly ambitious. I mean, how, how, what was the reaction to this? I, it, well, there was no internet back then, so it's hard to tell. It's, um, it, it was a good-looking game. Uh, it was, I didn't go deep enough with the adventure portion of it, I thought. But I, I always remember, I, got, I actually got a fan letter on that game, um, and it was from people who worked at Babbage's, and... Um, they, they wrote saying, hey, Mr. Divine, we wanted to write you, and I can't believe they tracked me down. Um, we love your game, Metropolis. As soon as everyone leaves the store, it's the first thing we load up. Uh, we just want to know the answer to the third adventure when we have to go rob the bank. What do we do there? And um, I just remember, you know, fan letter back then to me was like, oh, my God, someone actually sent me a fan letter. Absolutely incredible. It just that, that, that I touched someone and... That's why I make games, is to touch people, so it, it, it was fantastic. So did you write back and give them the answer? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I did, but, you know, <laughs> honestly, I can't remember. Oh, well, then we've got Spot, 
uh, which is based on a little 7-Up character. And that seemed like a pretty big shift from uh, Metropolis to Spot. You know, so how did this how did this take place? Well, those games in between, there was um, Turbo Champions was right after Metropolis, and then um, Ray Trace versus the Mega Death Aliens was right after Turbo Champions. Then Spot was, um, there was a game called Infection that had come into, I was working for a company called Mostronic at the time, um, had come in from the, the Amiga, and um, um, Martin Alpha wanted to 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 make infection crossed over he saw the circles in there and he's like i know the perfect license for this it's just... <laughs> and so we're like of course it's the seven up spot so um dan chang and i made um made spot for the 8-bit nintendo in six weeks and all we had to start with was the 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 um the amiga game infection with with the rules to the game an 8-bit nintendo that was a commercial model a really bad photocopy of the Japanese uh, programming manual and, uh, and an EEPROM burner. Uh, and so we, we had to write an assembler, we had to write, uh, we had to work out from the Japanese manual how to actually make an EEPROM work, and we had to burn EEPROMs to actually test any code. So we would go down to Toys R Us every day and buy up all of the uh, Zelda gold cartridges because. Those are the only ones you can put EEPROMs into at the time. And we would sit with our soldering irons and take the EEPROM out for Zelda and put our own EEPROMs in. So we were at Toys R Us every single morning competing with all the moms and dads because it's almost Christmas. We were trying wow. to get a Zelda game for their kids. And we're just looking to get the, you know, to buy it and pull out the EEPROM actually out of it. Oh, yeah, that was, that was how you made games. <laughs> so did you get some free 7-Up cases of 7-Up as you're working on this? or? That's got no caffeine, so that must have been a real challenge. <laughs> seven up toys. I, I, I still, or does seven up have caffeine? I, I don't remember. I don't know. But still, going through my garage, I'll find boxes of those seven up dolls, and I'll find like a hundred of them. Like, oh, there's another hundred seven up dots. Uh, but that's great. Well, one of the uh, there's a game called Silver Surfer. Uh, which is, you know, of course, is from the Marvel comics. Every comics nerd knows <laughs> knows about Silver Surfer, and that's that's a, the first game I could find that you worked with Rob uh, Landerus, at least what I could find on Moby Games. And it's a 1991, a 1990 game for the NES, and it's also been called one of the hardest NES games, and that's really saying something. <laughs> I was like, hey, you know, tell me a little bit about this Silver Surfer game. Yeah, when I can beat the Japanese shooter games at being hard, that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, I was still at, uh, at Mastertronic and um, I'd gone to Martin Alpha with several ideas for games and it's like, I, you know, there's this movie coming out called Batman, I think we should get the license and he's like, yeah, that's not going to do good and then there's this new comic book I read called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles I'd like to get the license for it yeah, never going to take off um, and so in the end he comes out and goes, this comic thing, there might be something to it yeah, we should go talk to Marvel and um, he's like, which Marvel character do you want? I'm like, the Hulk. He's like, you could have Silver Surfer. <laughs> so um, the Silver Surfer game was, um, and then at the time the Mobius book had just come out with Silver Surfer, which was one of the, the, the big graphic novels for Silver Surfer. Um, and um, the company, Software Creations, that actually did the programming on the game wanted to make a game which was an adventure game with Silver Surfer. Which is a great idea, um, except Martin really, 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 really wanted a shooter. And, um, you know, the guy paying the bills uh, gets to make the game. Um, so we made a shooter. And um, so Software Creations was, um, they really, really, really wanted to make the adventure game. And they would put up, you know, lots of reasons as to why the shooter wasn't possible. And so it slowly got to be harder and harder and harder to make. And the game got harder and harder and harder and more contrived. Um, but in the end, it, 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 it came out as this, this force of creation between software creations and myself of we were trying to make something together that was not the adventure game and yet still a shooter. And uh, yeah, it became one of the hardest uh, to finish games ever on the, uh, on the 8-bit Nintendo. And there are YouTube videos still today of people playing that game and trying to not touch the, uh, uh, the orbs or whatever is in one of the levels that you have to avoid. So can you can you do it? At the time, I could. Uh, now, I don't think so. <laughs> and 
that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part two of my interview with Mr. Graham Devine. Lots of great, great stuff coming up, so stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated and supported the show. I just uh, celebrated my 35th birthday on August the 20th. Got a lot of great happy birthday wishes from you guys and even a really cool gift from an anonymous fan, a Fallout uh, New Vegas Ultimate Edition that I'm Really looking forward to playing. I played the uh, the original, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what the Ultimate Edition has to offer. So uh, thanks very much, and uh, I want to thank everyone else who has uh, donated to the show. And if you if you would like to donate, uh, you can do that at armchairarcade.com. Just look for the Match Hat link at the top right corner, and you'll be good to go. Now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week I have a little number called the. A uh, Holy Moses White Ale. Uh, this is brewed in Cleveland Ale. I'm sorry, in Cleveland, Ohio. I promise I haven't had any, any of this yet. Uh, handcrafted White Ale with spices and chamomile. Uh, that's interesting. I like chamomile. Um, that should be quite relaxing. It doesn't tell you what spices are in it. Uh, very uh, inspiring little graphic there on the bottle. Apparently is the gold medal winner of the World Beer Championships. 5.4% alcohol by volume, so it shouldn't be too bad. Let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some Holy Moses White Ale here in the old drinking horn. I've been uh, smelling this, sort of enjoying the aroma. Very peachy, apricotty, fruity uh, bouquet, if you will. It's quite nice. Uh, let's give it a taste. That's really, really smooth. Do a... Uh, you know, with these white ales, uh, to me, they're very, uh, it's very good for a summer uh, beer. That's usually how they're marketed, and I think quite rightly. If you've been out working out in the lawn, you want to come in, have a nice uh, ale, you really can't go wrong with a white ale uh, for that. It's very relaxing, soothing, refreshing kind of drink, and this one is uh, definitely no exception. <clears throat> uh, Taste-wise, I'm... Uh, I'm getting a little, you know, sort of peachy. I guess I can sort of taste a bit of a chamomile uh, there, but mostly that sort of peachy apricot, apricot kind of taste you get with the uh, white ales. It's a very, very uh, smooth ale, uh, quite enjoyable, kind of snappy on the uh, tongue there. I'm going to go ahead and give this one a four out of five drinking horns. I think you'll really enjoy this, especially if you are tired and need to, uh, you know, chill with a good ale. Uh, go for the Holy Moses White Ale. All right, let's finish up with a quotation. Um, now, a bit of sad news happened today. Uh, Mr. Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, passed away. Uh, so in his honor, I looked up a quotation from him for, the, for this episode. And it goes something like this. I held up my thumb and it blotted out the planet Earth. See you guys next week. Fredo, Jen, he was... He was sort of a pimp. Oh, shut up. Wasn't he, Moss? Huh? Fredo, in the film, he was, he was essentially a pimp. No, he took the ring to Mordor. <laughs>